Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next panel, which is moderated by Bo Collins, who's the CEO of Mercantile Bank. The title of this panel is called Democratization of Financial Products, Designing Investments Products Focused on Digital Assets. Also wanted to remind you that after this panel, Silvio will give a quick uh, summation of everything that happened today, and then there will be um, automated networking post-conference. So please enjoy this next panel. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a dialogue with these uh, esteemed participants. Uh, and I, I think we should start by having you each introduce yourself. Do you want to start, Jose? Sure. Um, so yeah, my name is Jose Fernandez. I'm uh, originally from uh, Madrid, Spain. I am an economist. Uh, I've worked in banking uh, for some of the biggest banks. Uh, eventually ended up as a trade officer working in different diplomatic missions for my government. Um, I ended up, that's how I ended up in New York as a consular officer in the Consulate General of Spain in, here in, in New York. And uh, uh, I was, that was about, yeah, that was 11 years ago. And I was then introduced to the concept of Bitcoin which kind of like turned uh, my world upside down because I went down that rabbit hole pretty ha hard, um, leaving my diplomatic position and uh, and starting uh, becoming an entrepreneur. I've uh, been an entrepreneur ever since, been uh, delving in, in blockchain ever since, and uh, um, uh, created, uh, co-founded uh, Atlas, which was a branchless community banking platform for the underbanked in, in West Africa. We brought formal banking to about 100,000 families in Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal. And I'm currently the CEO and founder of Vanquish, which uh, turns uh, the um, uh, payouts and ratings of gate workers into an alternative credit scoring system that is currently accepted by the largest banks in Latin America. Ben, how about you? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Benjamin Tsai. I'm uh, president and managing partner here at Away Financial. Uh, we are an asset management firm in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Uh, my background is actually in traditional finance. Uh, after business school, I went out to Asia and spent 15 years in Asia in traditional finance, 12 of with, which with Merrill Lynch. Uh, I was uh, the head of structure products for equity and fixed income across Asia and then subsequently ran the commodities business across the region. Uh, after that, I spent three years with Alliance Bernstein as head of alternative investments, looking after all sorts of interesting and esoteric products. About four years ago, came back to the U.S. and uh, went down the rabbit hole of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, started a, a nonprofit working with the schools and government here. And um, you know, about two years ago, I met up with my business partner, David Seamer, and we started Wave Financial. Our focus is on asset management in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Uh, we have a number of crypto products. Uh, we've also uh, tokenized whiskey, which I think we can talk about later on. That's why I have the whiskey barrel on my wall here. And uh, and uh, finally, uh, we also do uh, wealth management. We have a wealth management platform with some uh, major clients who uh, manage their wealth with us on the crypto side. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. I am um, Collins. I'm the CEO of Mercantile Bank International. I started my career with the Federal Reserve and after a number of years migrated into dip, uh, derivative trading. Um, uh, it was the head trader for what now is Kinder Morgan uh, and was invited to become the president of the New York Mercantile Exchange, which was the largest commodity exchange in the world at the time. And um, shortly after that, I began a career uh, in investing and incubating companies. and. Uh, found my way into investing in Bitcoin at $13, which was exciting, uh, and have enjoyed the ride ever since, um, and ultimately decided to build infrastructure that would support uh, crypto trading and banking and the, the uh, transmission of fiat on and off to the uh, various crypto ramps. We were the first bank in the United States to receive a license to receive deposits and, and custody in crypto. Uh, and we're thrilled to see that the OCC has uh, recently opened that up as a safe harbor to uh, all national banks. Um, yeah, and I'd love to start uh, today's discussion by sort of uh, asking, jumping right into the future, I guess. You know, the last decade of blockchain development and innovation has unleashed an explosion of ideas and innovations that purport to deliver benefits to investors to solve various deficiencies and legacy products. I'm curious what you two guys think is the most 
support and innovation that we'll adopt in the next decade around traditional asset classes, which would be fiat, equity, debt, real property, but also the blockchain related asset classes, which I actually think are few, um, including perhaps some of the hybrids. Uh, you want to start, Jose? Um, sure. I mean, uh, depends on how far in the future we're talking about. I mean, I, I always like lately, um, 2020 has been such a, such a strange year. You get to do a lot of arm to, um, you know, armchair, uh, conversations with people about, you know, you, you get that moment of pause and you get to talk with people about the future a bit and, you know, um, AI, CRISPR and blockchain are going to change, are going to fundamentally change how humanity works and blockchain is going to decentralize most of, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I have a hard time thinking uh, like there's, there's a big difference between long-term and midterm midterm. It's going to be, it's going to be a hard transition where there's going to be a lot of legacy systems working with, um, with decentralized technologies. And, uh, and there's going to be a lot of frictions, regulatory frictions. There's going to be frictions when it comes to format, um, and, and, and compatibility between these two and, 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 you know, uh, competition. Um, and, uh, but you know, long-term is a different, it's a different question. Uh, Benjamin, do you have any kind of insights or predictions about how you think these asset classes may evolve in the next decade? Yeah, sure. I was commenting with somebody else actually previously. I think there's a there's usually a, a mix of conversations between crypto, blockchain, and use of blockchain in finance. I think those are two three areas that you know are very intertwined, but at the same time are complete separate threads. Which I, I'm happy to kind of try, try to address a little bit. Don't want to take too much time. I think uh, you know blockchain adoption could be across many different things, including non-financial stuff like you know supply chain management and so on and so forth. So I'll set that aside. That's a pretty wide um, you know discussion. I think within kind of the finance investment worlds are two main areas. One is using blockchain for digital assets, which is similar to you know discussions of kind of wrapping hard assets into funds like my whiskey fund and so forth. And the other part of it is crypto, really looking at uh, you know generating value through the pure uh, you know ownership of uh, you know certain assets in the crypto space. And I think that's the part that I think traditional finance is having a much harder time to wrap uh, their head around. We are seeing some adoption to that, and that is uh, part of why I think Bitcoin has been driven up in value very significantly. And uh, you know that's actually the interesting part from uh, my perspective. And I think there is kind of an intersection there in the middle where, uh, which was a boom last year for the people who are in the crypto space called uh, DeFi and decentralized finance. And, uh, you know, there's the centralized finance, which, uh, you know, is being done by a lot of people, uh, you know, trying to follow kind of securities laws and, and so forth regulations and a decentralized version where it's very much, you know, dep depending on technology and having, you know, the people taken out the middle to see if that can help the situation. Some implementations have worked, some implementations have not worked so well. So all of that is still developing. I expect a lot of these areas to uh, potentially mature in the next few years, and it is quite exciting. Have, uh, I should know this already, but uh, have you actually tokenized your whiskey fund? So we have launched our fund. We've closed our fund at the end of last year. We've done a successful raise. We've bought whiskey. It's sitting in a warehouse. We're starting to age it. We will be issuing tokens in a year, and this goes back to kind of the uh, you know, first year lockup for a Reg D offering. We've decided to just follow that and not issue the tokens until one year in. Right. We've already signed a, uh, a a letter of intent to be listed on INX, the largest U.S. exchange mm -hmm. by name, and uh, we're looking forward to having a listing in a vibrant market there. That's excellent. Um, one one of the, the the things that your comments sort of lead me into is our this collision course from my perspective, that I feel like we're on with DeFi and regular. Um, I can speak to our bank's ex experience in KYC and AML and the very rigid uh, requirements around Bank Secrecy Act compliance. Um, and, and when you evaluate DeFi, um, even though I, I believe the intentions of the marketplace are uh, noble, um, th there is a gigantic gap between what regulators compel on institutions transmitting money 
and what, if any, regulatory surveillance is happening in a DeFi platform. Some of that tippy toes around the, the, the disembarkation about who is moving the money. Is it the platform or the person? And generally the platforms take the position that they are communication devices and, and they're not a transmission device. But the actual transmission is being authorized from one individual to the other. The, the, the law does not, uh, in, a, in a very kind way, address those peculiarities. And, and I hear very little dialogue in, in our circles around how DeFi is thinking about this and addressing it. And most of them, I believe, are kind of whistling past the graveyard. Uh, do, do you guys see any material efforts in DeFi that are going to satisfy the regulatory framework, particularly for law enforcement? I'll I'll kick off here, Jose. Feel free to to comment uh, after that. Uh, you know, I come from a very regulated world. Uh, you know, while I was working in Asia, I worked in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, and I've got licenses in every single region along with the U.S. So, you know, separate from the fact that I had to take a lot of exams, I'm, I'm intimately familiar <laughs> with the pains of being in a regulated space. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what fascinated me and horrified me at the same time when I started in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space was that there were a lot of technology people who are finding efficiencies by skipping the regulatory part or coming up with ways to get around the regulatory part. And some of which I think are viable or make sense and some of which don't. And I think I, I won't comment specifically on individual projects, but I think in general, uh, you know, some of the efficiency that's been squeezed out comes from the fact that they're not that there's not a need to follow regulations. And that makes it a, a slightly unfair playing field. And, and I think the regulations probably should kick in to a certain extent to do that. I think it's a tricky one to say, look, we're, we're just providing the software layer. We're not involved in the transaction. But it's it's it, that that's a that's a tough one. Right. It's like, well, we make the baseball bats. We're not in charge of the damage a baseball bat can do. That's an easier discussion than, well, we're gun makers, but we're not in charge of, you know, the damage the gun can do. It gets grayer and grayer as it goes. And there's no easy way to draw that line. Right. And at the same time, I think recently in the news, uh, there's there's a whole discussion of, you know, having tech platforms not be responsible for the content that tech platforms serve and so forth. And that is, in a, in a, to a certain extent, a similar discussion. And funnily enough, for some of these discussions, I land on one side and some I land on the other side. And it's really more of a it's a very complicated point, specifically to um, to, you know, some, uh, you know, another question, part of the question you asked. I agree with you that most platforms have not been doing this out of negative intent. I mean, there's no intentional fraud. I think people are doing it mostly for for the goodness of it. But there have been projects that have. Uh, you know, imploded due to technical issues. There has been project that has imploded due to fraud. There are uh, 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 platform issues that have imploded due to, uh, you know, just a, a lack of thought in terms of governance and the governance engine eating up the platform. So there are, there have been, you know, many examples of why, you know, a lot of these platforms, you know, by skipping the, the regulatory environment, by skipping a lot of that, uh, you know, they, they sort of, they shortcutted themselves to a quick solution, but the quick solution didn't work well over a long time. And long time being six months is not even a, you know, 10 years later broke, not, not that discussion, <laughs> right? So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. I think I can babble on for a long time. I'd love to. No, but I'm, you know, I'm very, I very much agree, Ben. Um, so in my experience, you know, the, the first time I was presented with, with a decentralized ledger, I was, you know, again, as an economist, I, I've been, I, I actually enjoy accounting. I'm like, this is the first technological um, evolution into the accounting system, into the entry world since the double entry system, you know, hundreds of years before. Um, I was very excited. And I remember when I met my co-founders, they were developing the first then uh, Bitcoin debit card, uh, a big, uh, debit card associated to a Bitcoin account. And, and they were having, you know, trouble raising. And I was like, well, why, why would you want to use this technology to offer another card in a city like New York that has, you know, millions of cards. Um, why, you know, we have the technology here to build a bank without the infrastructure of a bank. Let's go where banks can't go. Um, so we packed up our bags and we went to, to rural Senegal, like the middle of nowhere Senegal. And uh, again, nothing but, but you know, dirt and, and baobab trees. And, you know, we had the, 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 the support of a few politicians and, and, and we were able to beta test our technology there. 
Um, and and again, we we never thought. I strongly believe that you can't just operate, um, you know, uh, aside from uh, regulation. Uh, I believe that regulation will have to change, and I believe that that you know regulation is slow, uh, and until then. It is better to use this, and I, I admire the, the the purists that are just focusing on the technology. But when we, when you apply it to people's finances, um, things change because because money matters. It it affects. It's a huge responsibility. It affects uh, the lives of families and and the lives of, of communities. Um, and um, and I was you know financial inclusion has always been my my passion, and and we really wanted to to make not just a scalable and broad impact, but also a deep impact, an impact that really, truly uh, improved the income levels of the, the communities and the families that we that we served. And um, and we eventually had to find a way where um, we had to work with banks. Um, we had to, we, we eventually, we knew that technologically we could become, you know, we had our own our own token. We had, you know, that, that, that fed the ecosystem. We had people uh, depositing money, essentially, you know, turning their fiat into our currency. We 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 could have, you know, tried to design this utopia that was beyond, you know, the central bank of of Senegal or of Ghana when we when we expanded there and that didn't use banks. But that would have just not been legal, and it would have put people in a lot of um, of danger when it comes to their finances. Again, this is all of they were man- we were managing the savings of, of all of these families. So we we chose to become a bridge to formal banking. These families had never had access to to not just savings, uh, you know, the safety of savings, but but microloans, you know, access to to l- large lump sums of money to be able to 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 you know expand their business and 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 grow. Uh, to turn, you know, my 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 focus, my pa- my obsession has always been, you know, getting people from surviving the day to thriving. Because uh, I believe that together we can just, you know, build a new renaissance if we got, you know, enough people out of that survival mode. Um, and um, and we had to go through KYC and AML. And it's tough because you have this technology that is basically impaired. Um, you have this very nimble technology that that is that is impaired by all by all of these regulations, because you need to you need to be able to to play with the banks um, and, and with the regulators to be able to uh, give them access Give them the impact, have the impact that you want to have. So um, again, this is it, it. Kind of like for me, it's a it, it's kind of a good connector with uh, the first part of uh, with your first question because I believe that there's a vast difference between the midterm b- between how the the midterm looks for for blockchain and DeFi and um, and crypto in general to the long term. So the long term is going to be radical. The midterm is going to be frictionful. It's there's going to be a lot of of balancing acts between working with traditional uh, banking systems and traditional regulators and traditional credit scoring bureaus, and 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 using this technology that could do so much better if you didn't have to. Uh, but again, you know, you're playing with people's finance. That is people's livelihoods. And um, you know, for for now, but my my current company, Bankwish, it. It is. It is also again connecting these these users, these gig workers that have a huge online reputation, and we're trying to give them ownership of that reputation through this blockchain database. But eventually, we use that to build this credit, you know, this uh, credit score for banks and its traditional banks. Um, and again, you have to go through KYC and AML, and compliance is an important factor. And and all of this, um, you know, kind of like takes away from from the. The trustlessness of blockchain, but um, it's it's a balancing act because right now I always go down when when we're having these these uh, leadership meetings with with my team. I always go down to what do we care more, the technology or the impact, and and the impact wins in our case. And that's when we, yeah you realize if you want, if you want to have that kind of impact with your with your constituents with your uh, clients, then that's that's what you got to do. That's great. I think we're just uh, joined uh, by Joe Sanchez. You want to say hello to everybody and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for joining a little late. Got a little confused with the time. I'm in a different time zone, but I'm from San Francisco, currently in Arizona right now. Uh, my background has always been in uh, the leading edge of transformational technology and finance. Um, I helped build one of the first ETS networks, which is uh, now called Zimbardo, 
I, um, I led uh, alternative investment strategy at Morgan Stanley. Um, and then I built a technology company after that, focusing on advancing crowdfunding and expanding that in the effort to democratize finance. Uh, from there, I've worked on a number of uh, fintech and, uh, and digital assets. I worked with a team from Bridgewater to um, build first dark pool infrastructure uh, asset exchange, uh, digital assets called the Mega One. And then uh, I've been involved in opening up access in uh, other types of uh, financial products in this space. So, and I also have a background in AI venture investing as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, we, we've been kind of talking about the impact on um, regulation as it relates to DeFi and investment products in particular. Um, and I, I want to kind of turn around to one of the, I'm very US centric in terms of thinking about regulation because that, that's where our bank operates. That's where um, I, I largely am responsible for uh, complying uh, relative to rules. And of course, the US and, and the EU both have um, kind of money transmitting rules uh, very aggressively in the last few years. So uh, in addition to money transmitting regulation, there's, there's a, a full library of regulation around securities and how securities or something deemed a security can actually be traded. Um, one of the things that's very interesting to me is trying to understand if we're in, in, in a twilight of soon coming to the realization that, uh, for instance, a security in Benjamin's whiskey pot could be liquid and easily transferred almost the way a currency could be in, in a blockchain environment. Um, and, and therefore, I could have a wallet full of many, many types of objects that would be deemed securities or currencies or real property or non-fungible assets. Um, but from a, from a user's perspective, I can then um, interchangeably use those as the currency of choice to the degree that the other side consents to that transaction. The question I think is important for us to, to start getting our heads around is what does the SEC, um, and for that matter, the European regulators, have to say about peer-to-peer -peer transactions of securities, and uh, or not peer-to-peer -peer transactions of securities, but, but transactions that would rather not be on a very, very high rate regulated infrastructure like an ETF, I'm sorry, an ATF, uh, or even you know a listed securities exchange. I don't know, Joe, if you have a, a viewpoint about the evolution of that and where we are in the, in, in the curve. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now is such a great time because you have two things coming together. You have both the innovation and the whole uh, technology stack regarding in finance. And you also have this liberalization of regulations that are occurring pretty much at the same time. And both of those factors are going to really provide explosive opportunities in this space. So if you look, for example, um, not only um, of how we're, how we're able to access, you know, I think capital formation is such a big thing for us to look at, is how do we bring more capital and how have that capital move more efficiently from a trading standpoint, as well as leverage for hypothecation and so forth. Um, but if you just look at, like, what's available in the SMB market for small business. Right. You know, they're able to access, you know, crowdfunding for the first time. And I think there's such uh, opportunities there where you could start to look at capital raises as a subscription model, as a more even like a SaaS, where people will just be running and in, in increasing capital, you know, on a concurrent analyzed basis, as opposed to having to do like a whole project based raise. Um, and what's going to open up there is, is they've opened it up to $5 million, but eventually they also have um, SPVs. So, so people can actually invest, and you can have a, one SPV that's actually you know, on your cap table. And when you could start to integrate that with um, um, you know, digital you know, uh, securities tokens, you could really start to expand this in a very powerful way. And I really think the markets are gonna start in the private markets, so in secondary share, um, and that's where the trades will be initially as they start to kind of expand outwards. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities also in, um, 
you know, what most people don't realize is also investment banking. I think there's a lot of rules around how you can raise capital, who can do it. You know, do you need a securities license to be an investment bank? Now, a lot of that's opening up too. There's a whole movement around mainstream, Main Street. Uh, and so you're going to be able to, to start a micro fund, which you could today for 10 million, and you don't need regulations for that. You could actually, you know, buy and sell a small business uh, and be able to do that. And that could just all be done through security tokens without being an investment banker up to a certain amount. They're talking about up to $50 million. And you'll be able to be an introduction, introducing broker, whether that's an individual or a firm, without having a securities license. And, and, and that's merely just connecting people together. And you'll be able to do that even more efficiently through digital assets. And so there's so much stuff happening. But what I think I'm really most excited about is there is a, there was a legislation called um, the Jobs Act 3.0, which was passed almost unanimously by, by the House, but never got voted on the Senate. And that that basically included a venture exchange. And that's another thing that's going to really open things up where you could start to have new opportunities and new types of, of market exchanges that don't have, need all the requirements that the ones today currently need. And so that we're just on the precipice of getting those approved. And you're going to really start to see this whole space really flourish. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll jump in there for a moment. Yeah, one of the things that that Joe mentioned that I'm really excited about was the the whole uh, kind of the in, idea of having introducers who are who don't need to be licensed. I think SEC put out some uh, you know notes for people to comment on, and um, I, I I don't know what, what status that is right now, but I'm hoping that that at some point will come through over the next twelve months, so that you know, we can get more people to be properly paid for the type of work that they want to do without going through the whole broker setup. The broker dealer setup, even though I'm kind of part of the system, it, it is quite unwieldy and it, it, it kind of leads people to want to get around the system, which just makes the whole conversation quite messy. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part I think Bo mentioned that I thought was very interesting is kind of the the blurring of the different assets and, you know, having a, an ownership above that. I was actually speaking with a company that uh, uh, that Franklin Templeton actually ended up buying, and they were developing a wallet that would hold multiple assets all the way through, and multiple assets being, you know, equity, fixed income, uh, you know, crypto, uh, fiat, and and just everything all on a wallet. And if you're at a coffee shop at a gas station, when you buy something, you could decide what you want to settle with. And obviously, you know, the technology behind using a, a fractional share of Apple to settle your gas bill is a kind of stupid why the heck do you want to do that and be technologically extremely difficult but the fact that somebody thought to work on that i thought was extremely interesting i would never do that but you know it's interesting that that becomes a a possibility and i think that groups things into things you use for settlement which is probably more currency based and you know just things you use for investment which is pretty much everything else and i think the equity and fixed income line is a very traditional way of looking at it and then you have kind of things that are in the middle like convertible debt and so forth and then you have commodities which are a bit out and then you have crypto which is quite a bit out especially for the the more mature market so i think all of that could potentially blend together um you know one of the predictions i've always said is you know, investment banks at some point will bolt on a crypto desk next to their commodities desk or their FX desk and just, you know, continue, right? Same systems, just new set of data, load it in, off we go. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that happens in the next five years, if not even less. Very good. Jose, any insights on that topic? Um, yeah, just um, more generally, my uh, my experience, it's, it's interesting because my experience in um, emerging markets has always been so much smoother than my experience in in, in Europe or the U.S. Um, so, uh, so I'm I'm an advisor to the Africa Chamber of Digital Commerce, and and then I I'm you know I'm I obviously have a lot of relationships with uh, regulators in, in in Mexico and Brazil and Latin America where I'm operating right now, and and it's interesting they all go through through a similar pattern. Um, you see. Uh, these regulators frustrated at banks because they um, because they most of these banks uh, you know they're they're big economies and these banks uh, they're they're few few banks in these countries and they're they're normally just um, para governmental institutions that that want those you know you know billion dollar um, contracts with with the government 
and and they don't care about the people. So eventually, you know, they try to force uh, these banks to offer services for 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 users. Um, and they 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 try it through legislation. You know, you have to you you have to um, issue two percent of your of your deposits into microloans, uh, whatever it might be. That banks always find a way to not do it. Eventually, they get lax on regulation to try to to uh, to to bring about more um, more fintech competition, and that's when you see really cool stuff happening because suddenly. Uh, blockchain is uh, suddenly crypto is an option and there's you know all these um, really brave really cool um, startups offering all kinds of tools to users because right now um, these governments essentially turn um, regulatory sandboxes um, you know create regulatory sandboxes that are live with live clients for all of these uh, fintechs to to hopefully get you know a few unicorns that will start to stimulate the economic um, uh, ecosystem, and um, and it's always exciting. Like right now, I find um, so um, obviously in Africa, I've seen a lot of that. India as well, but um, right now, I'm on my main market of my current um, uh, my current startup. I actually I actually started in Brazil, but my main market was current, currently shifted to Mexico because um, the government ba- basically gave us all the fintechs uh, pretty much a a blank check to do a lot of things. And you see a lot of different um, uh, training platforms, a lot of, you know, platforms like my own where I'm building a, a, a credit score that is, you know, competing with traditional credit bureaus, with with gig working data, with gig platform data, um, you know, on the blockchain. So it's, they're, they're allowing all these things. So I, I think that we're going to start seeing um, a few of these uh, companies become unicorns and and come into uh, with, with that know-how to having done those beta testings in those markets um, will will come into um, you know the U.S., Europe, uh, you know Japan, you name it, and uh, and will try to to you know use their power and their their volume to to massage their way into regulatory net, uh, you know regulatory strongholds and, and and ease the way for the rest of the competition. I, I can't be moderating a panel in January and not ask each of you for your your most prescient prediction for 2021. So, anybody have any uh, insightful advice for investors in 2021? It's it's an interesting one. Uh, I'll 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 take a stab at it. I think um, people in, I think people in the U.S. are not uh, quite paying attention to what's happening kind of in Asia in terms of crypto adoption, and I think that speed of adoption is actually increasing quite a lot. I don't know if you're seeing this in Latin America, but certainly it's happening in Asia in a speed that is uh, a bit of a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. Uh, and uh, you know, for example, uh, DBS, uh, you know, what used to be called Development Bank of Singapore, it has, uh, you know, really said, you know, they're going to support crypto for institutional use. And I spoke with them and they are, they're not adding a crypto subsidiary to their business. This is not like Fidelity opening Fidelity digital assets. They're saying they'll support Bitcoin as a settlement currency for their institutional clients in the main bank. And that was extremely impressive to me. Wow. They are now a custodian. They're licensed in Singapore. They're basically the biggest local bank in Singapore. And they're saying, yeah, we want to settle in dollars of Bitcoin. We'll take it. And wow. that is, this is this is not a new bank. This is not Revolut saying, hey, let's do some Bitcoin. This is, you know, the, the largest, you know, bank with, you know, a whole bunch of infrastructure projects on their balance sheet and so forth doing that. So it is, it, from my perspective, it has officially gone mainstream. Right. Uh, it, yeah, we're also seeing this happening, uh, you know, kind of in Europe. Standard Charter recently launched uh, their custody service. We had actually been speaking with them even before launch. You know, we gave them a lot of feedback as part of the launch. We know the guys that are providing the technology behind that. And it's actually quite exciting. And they, they plan on doing this globally, but they are kind of a European bank. And we're, we're seeing that really from an aggressive perspective. So I would say this year people are going to realize that the mainstream adoption is happening 
uh, you know, right under your eyes or is happening a, a bit more than people have realized. And, and I think that then there will be a catch up and so forth. And now, obviously, DBS hasn't started servicing their private bank or their real retail clients for that yet, but they, they are you know, servicing their corporate institutional clients. So, you know, it's, it's just a few steps away. And, and once again, this is very different from Fidelity opening Fidelity to digital assets and having a completely separate micro ecosystem that they can, you know, wrap their head around and then be able to manage. And we have an account there. We, we like those guys. I think that we're, we think they're doing a great job. But, you know, at the end of the day, that is uh, that's that's kind of a sandbox. And the DBS way is kind of, you know, diving in head first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is fascinating. Interesting to know. But, uh, Jose, you have any insights for 2021? Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. So I, I see a lot of um, institutional support. I think um, I think we're going to have a, a 2021 that is going to be very shaky uh, because I, I think we're going to find two two very strong opposing forces on the one end. I'm 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 uh, very much looking forward to uh, general economic growth from from, you know, vaccines and and uh, just uh, people going out and, and start, you know, enjoying and uh, and thriving again. Um, so we're going to have that, uh, you know, which is going to is going to do well for all the for all the institutional money and all the institutional support that that uh, crypto has has been having uh, recently. And um, and then and then we're going to have uh, regulation that is going to be catching up. Uh, so you know, there's. Uh, there's going to be it's it's going to be a, a, a shaky, a bumpy, bumpy year, uh, which I think is always a fun, interesting, interesting time. Very good. Joe, how about you? Yeah, um, for one, I think the recent news with the Office of, of the Controller being able to allow banks to um, participate in stable coins and and settlement is really going to open the door, I think, for a lot of acquisitions in this space. I think all the all these brokers and prime, you know, um, prime brokers out there eventually will start to see them getting acquired by banks and and the large traditional uh, brokerage firms. And in addition to that, I also think there's a great opportunity again in SMBs. I, I think this is really the um, it's been a really challenging year for SMBs, but I think at the same time there's so much incentives, a lot of institutional money is going behind SMBs, and a lot of uh, new regulatory, you know, opportunities as well to make more access there. And I think there's really an interesting, like, gateway or bridge between, you know, what's being created in the in the digital asset space to supporting, you know, SMBs, which is a huge part of, of the economy, 95% really economic engine. And there are things that if you could just make SMBs more efficiently, especially with, with their capital efficiency and raising capital, it has tremendous impact on the GDP of many countries. So... Very That's where it happens. I have two predictions for 2021. You guys can, uh, w w one is simple. I think Bitcoin will see below 30 uh, before we see above 50 uh, this year. Uh, that, that being said, I'm still wildly bullish long term, uh, but I'm, I am a trader after all. Uh, the second prediction I have is rooted in our, our in, in intense experience around money transmission and, and compliance. Um, and, and there's a gap in the, 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 the blockchain world has created, in some regards, the easiest to surveil system ever. It's way easier to surveil the, the, the full uh, path, if you will, of money in, in crypto. With one exception, you can't prove who owns a wallet. That has to be fixed for us to synchronize the compliance regimes that I believe Western nations are going to continue to compel on the world. They're going to grow their reach on that. And so I think you're going to see proposals this year uh, for a national registry of wallets with that, that with hmm. steep penalties um, for non-compliance if, if you're a U.S. citizen. If you don't mind, I would love to jump in and comment on sure. that. I think... Uh, we, we run a wealth management business and we're having a lot of clients that have come to us that said that are saying, you know, that they've bought, you know, Bitcoin between 10 to 100 Bitcoin. 
Back in the day, you keep it on a horror wallet, nobody cares, there's not a lot of money. But now that with the current price, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I, I need to keep this in a better place than what's on a horror wallet. So we are seeing business from that perspective. And, and I think that that leads to a, a discussion of, you know, and our suggestion to him, to them, is that we're, we're moving this money onto uh, qualified custodians. And this is going back to almost a more traditional centralized setup where, you know, you get a bank statement at the end of the, or you get a custodian statement at the end of the month, this is what you hold and so forth. And it's a little more centralized, yet it's offline and, and so forth. So so I think that that, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. Bo, I, I agree with you that I think over the long term for people who are not actively looking to hide their assets or, you know, don't trust the government, that kind of thing, I think that, that there, there will be kind of that direction. Uh, the, the random comment with regards to below 30, I, I have a, a buy order at, at 29,000. We'll see if it gets there. I've left it there for a few days now. The, the very recent crash didn't get there, so I, it's still sitting there. So I'm like, I put it in. It's going to be there. I'm in front of the queue. Well, we'll see how that goes. Um, and and the last last thing I'll mention that Joe Joe mentioned the OCC, and I think it's it's super interesting. Uh, yesterday, I think uh, the guy at OCC, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name, came out and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna give a license to you know to for a national crypto bank." And I think this morning I saw the news. I think it was Anchorage that actually got that license. So. On one side, you know, from the, the crypto perspective, everybody's cheering, this is great. And at the same time, I was reading Bloomberg and I saw this article like some outgoing regulator at the OCC is now giving away free licenses and all the banks are pissed. I'm like, oh, that's a different way of looking at the situation. That's very interesting. And <laughs> and that that was after I read an article on, you know, some of the other outgoing regulators throwing in all sorts of random kitchen sink stuff. So it's and I'm not here to comment on what, you know, which side of it is on. But it's very interesting that there are very divergent opinions on a lot of these things. And, you know, I, and, and this maybe points back to what everyone's saying. I think this year will be very interesting as the as the dust settles or, or more dust gets thrown up, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I... The, the recent movements in OCC, I actually have welcomed uh, with open arms because I think it, it, in order for a, a financial system to work, there has to be many players. Um, and, and you want to inspire widespread adoption of, of the transmission technology. Right? So, so crypto really is kind of two pieces. In one, in one case, it's, it's, a, it's a system of consensus Around the value of your token for access, so that that's a that's that's the asset uh, valuation of crypto. But the blockchain is the delivery mechanism, and until we have more and more uh, large traditional institutions, or for that matter, midsize, lead the charge with the deployment of blockchain-related delivery, you're always going to be struggling with the utility of crypto as a currency. So if you, if you look at some of the original um, uh, cases that were made for why Bitcoin was so fabulous, um, the, the dream of what they had intended on delivering has really been uh, fallen short of its actual effectiveness. So uh, you can go through a matrix of is, is it cheaper actually to trans, transmit funds via blockchain than ACH, as an example? Um, in most cases, it's not. Um, is it cheaper or rather faster to communicate funds via a blockchain mechanism um, rather than traditional banking? And if you, if you look at uh, services like I, I have a bank account with Chase Manhattan, they are, are using a service uh, that I find wildly uh, uh, capable, um, and I can transmit money uh, not only inside of Chase but outside of Chase using that system. And the speed of delivery, where it shows up in, in another bank account, is nearly competitive with blockchain. So, um, and, and then you can go down the anarchist dream of like the government won't interfere with what we're doing. You know, there are some things that it's achieved. So it has achieved the ability to avoid debasement of the currency. We we all know how many Bitcoin will exist from here on in. So it's had successes in some of its early ambitions, but there's there's a long list of achievements that are yet to be made that I think will be made 
I think we will have faster delivery. I think there will be cheaper mechanisms. But this evolution is going to also spill into the regulatory uh, uh, frameworks. And I, I'm, I'm intensely focused on that because I think that's where the most trouble is brewing. And if we, if we can see um, some gaps being completed like this nas National Registry of Wallets, y yes, it, 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 it hurts your ability to act anonymously and without the government being aware of it, but that's what the government wants anyways. The government is not in favor of anonymous transactions. They just aren't. Um, and, and, they're, and the reason why they're not in favor of it is mostly for good intentions. They want to prohibit the uses of funds for activities that are harmful to society. Um, so so I, I see a world where the adoption of Bitcoin and the adoption of other crypto assets is going to explode as we develop regulatory certainty around it. That's, the, that's hence the basis of some of my predictions. So um, I think we've used up most of our time. Does anybody have uh, any parting comments? We're all good? Well, I want to thank you all for participating. Your insights have been very interesting and useful, and uh, I hope to see you all soon. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank, great. You, thank you both. Thank you. How's it? Thank you. Thanks.